All okay. right, so let me share again. Okay, so you're all familiar with the note well. I'll just put this up here for a few minutes just to remind everybody that we're under the IPR policy of the IEPF. Um, so today we're gonna go over uh, ECH issues. So I'll let uh, Chris kick that off. Um, which issue would you like to chat about first? Um, let's go to... Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Which one is it? Uh, 233. 233? Yeah. Oh, geez, I'm sorry. Not 233. Um, uh, 274. I got confused. No problem. All right. Take it away. Oh. So if you scroll all the way to the bottom, I believe Chris has updated this with the latest changes. Yeah, it doesn't have Karthik's suggestion, but it has, uh, it's uh, Ben Schwartz's suggestion. <laughs> I think that's where we are. <laughs> cool. Do you want to describe the three variants for folks? Uh, the, the, the existing one, um, well, we have, we kind of decide, oh, okay, sorry. Um, okay, uh, so trial decryption, trial HMAC, and then the current proposal. Uh, yeah, basically, but, but HMAC, like, there's a different variance for how the HMAC is computed. Um, one of them is like mixing in the client and the server hello random. Oh, I don't know what those variants are. I was just thinking of the, um, uh, I was just thinking of the, Oh, uh, compute an HMAC over the server hello uh, using a key derived from the master key or from the main key, uh, main secret, um, and uh, and 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 stick the prefix of that HMAC in the server hello random. Is that what you're describing? You're talking about? Yeah, but I think we're getting into to the weeds. Hold on, let me. I feel like you made a, you left a comment at some point that summarized the issue quite nicely, um, but I'm trying to find it. So the um, the PR for this is converged on. Basically, the proposal is um, you compute uh, you 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 essentially hash the client hello inner and uh, the the first twenty four bytes of the uh, server hello random, the client hello inner random and the server hello inner random, and that's how you get the um, that's how you get the confirmation indication. Right. Thank you. Um, uh, okay, so yeah, there's uh, the existing design, which does nothing with, but trial decryption. There is this trial HMAC, as you describe it, which um, includes uh, an HMAC computed over the client hello and server hello random, or part of it, um, as you've just described. And then there is Karthik's design, which is not yet written up in PR form uh, or documented in the issue. Um, but it's, it's effectively an extension of this trial HMAC thing where you uh, derive a key uh, from the handshake secret and use that to compute um, an HMAC and shove it in the server hello random, um, doing a trick similar to how you one computes PSK binders. Um, and so the question is, uh, you know, which of these is, is the right, I guess, trade-off in terms of complexity and, um, you know, plugging the, the attacks that we're concerned of. Um, and as you suggested, the, the current PR converged on um, the, the simple, you know, quote, simple trial HMAC variant um, that helps protect against sort of trivial replays or benign replays in the network. Um, and the, the rationale for doing so, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, is because any sort of active attacker who is trying to learn whether or not uh, ECH was actually negotiated has plenty of other avenues for doing so. Um, and this isn't particularly, this isn't like a useful thing to address, this, these sort of replay attacks that Christian laid out. Now, unfortunately, he's not here to speak for it. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure how far we can get, but I, I guess I'd like to pause and, you know, ask the, the folks here if they have, if, if, they've, if they're familiar with Christian's attack, uh, and if they are, are they concerned about it? 
or whether or not we can just press onward with what's written in the PR for 274. All right, Zarek. Um, so, uh, I mean, I guess, so first of all, I think it's pretty clear that like, well, I don't know what you want to call it, but uh, the, the trial HVAC uh, variants are superior to the trial encryption variants for the quick re reasons Dave mentioned and pointed out real quick. Um, and I think that in terms of how to spell it, it's also pretty clear to probably go in the server hello, uh, because otherwise it's like even incredibly obvious signal whether or not this was whether or not this was deployed, which is to say, does the extension appear in the server, from, in the invested from the server, which we recall was the reason um, for doing this in the first place. Um, the, uh, I mean, I think this goes to the threat model. Uh, the question is, what are we trying to accomplish? I think we're trying to accomplish it being like modestly hard to determine whether a given connection um, uses, uh, you know, use DCH. Um, and I think modestly hard, obviously, is like a, you know, it is a fuzzy criterion, but it seems to me that like either terminating every connection and then allowing the client to reestablish them, um, which is what with Christian's attack or having to like, having to scrub through DNS, neither of which counts as modestly hard. Um, and so, um, you know, if people are willing to do either of those two things, um, then uh, basically, as far as I can tell, we don't, we have one of the defenses. Um, um, in particular, we do not have a defense against the uh, against the DNS um, scraping one. Um, so, um, so I, I think you know, like I'm on the fence about like so I'm on the fence about whether that the the, the uh, you know folding the key in is worth doing. But uh, I mean, it's like you know, there's always sort of a belt and suspenders kind of like maybe you should make things better kind of thing. Um, so I would, wouldn't fight like vehemently against it, but I'm also like not not all sure we need it. Um, it's worth noting that if we decide we do if we if we decide not to do it now. And we decide we want it later. It's actually quite straightforward to add because you can simply put an extension in the um, ECH config and it doesn't need to appear on the TLS on the, on the wire in TLS. So you, the, the ECH config would just say, you know, I speak, uh, I speak the variant in which, um, you know, uh, in, in, in which you fold the, the handshake secret in. Um, so like, like an extended handshake secret thing? Uh, no, I mean, I, I mean, you can call it that, but I mean, there, I mean, so um, I mean, the ECH config has extensions in it, right? And so you just say. Um, that uh, for this config, if you offer this config and I take it, I'm going to fold in the handshake in the, in, in the same in the same block that you're ordinarily using that you were using without that. Um, so, um, so so it's a straightforward extension to add. Uh, which I mean, this another side of the issue. Um, and like I say, I'm sort of weakly in favor of not doing it because it seems like this has already gotten quite complicated. But I'm not going to like go out on the road here. Yeah, I I agree. Um, I think this is the right trade off in terms of complexity and. Uh... Yeah, usefulness in terms of like addressing this, this sort of m modestly capable attacker. Um, I mean, this is, I guess, I guess we're knowing, we're knowing this is like not like, you know, this is not like Tor. It's, on, it's like not a technology where we're attempting to like make this completely invisible. Um, um, if we were, we have made a whole bunch of different design choices. Um, so it's an analogy um, where we're hoping to make it kind of a pain in the ass to determine like, connections using it. <laughs> Um, and yeah. I, I think I think about a lot of that is like, and a lot of that, frankly, is you know avoiding just trivial versions where throw middle middlebox off with ossification. Yeah, I agree. Um, that actually goes uh, it, it right into the threat model. Uh, there is a separate issue for uh, actually writing down sort of the threat model and the security goals against that particular attacker. Um, and I, I put down in that issue um, uh, just a, a high level summary of what the what I think the threat model should be and what we should be targeting. And I think it aligns with what you're, um, you know, uh, describing. Uh, so I guess maybe we could pop over there unless anyone else has any sort of objections to what's in this current PR and issue. I, guess I want to say we should merge this PR um, because okay, even, if, even if, like, even if we subsequently decide to make the handshake in, like, we just got a lot of stuff on, like, on the floor right now. And if we merge this PR, the handshake thing will just slot right in perfectly well into a separate PR. So, like, we should merge this PR no matter what. Yep, agreed. And uh, Chris Patton, you're in the queue. Yeah, I just wanted to. I just wanted to support what Ecker said. Basically, um, I would also be fine with adopting something like Karthik's suggestion. Um, I'm skeptical that it actually solves the problem of providing don't stick out security against active attackers. Um, it does seem possible to me to to achieve this if. For, for for deployments where the ECH configuration is not easily accessible to the adversary, but that's not going to be true for the vast majority of deployments, at least initially. 
Um, so I think this is a, I, I just think this is a problem worth um, taking some time to study before. Um, and I think in particular because if we implement something complex now that we need to to replace later, it's going to be a lot harder. The thing, the, the current PR is pretty simple and it's easy to replace if we need to. And I also really liked um, Ecker's suggestion of, of, of using an extension for this purpose. It's actually a pretty nice feature of the, of the, of the protocol that the signal is, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of hidden in the, in the server hello random already. So it's easy to do something stronger if we want to in the future. Um, so yeah, uh, that's Cool. Uh, Joe, can you go back to the issue list? Yep. Uh, number 260, please. Um, so Chris pointed out that we really haven't um, clearly described the threat model, at least in the introduction leading up to the design, um, or maybe in the secu security considerations. We have of course, documented some of the attacks and um, uh, some of the design flaws that we had in earlier versions of ESNI, but we've not, I, I guess, been a bit, we've not been really crisp in terms of what the attacker is and what its goals are. So um, this is my attempt, or this is our attempt to sort of document um, uh, the, the, the threat model um, with respect to sort of the, uh, two general types of attackers, uh, one of which is a passive attacker, something that can't probe is just like looking at bytes flying uh, back and forth across the wire. Um, these might be our stupid ossifying middle boxes, um, things that can't look at DNS, so on and so forth. Um, and then you have just a general class of active attackers that can probe, do all sorts of crazy things. And um, these are more or less um, sensors. Um, and, and the goals, I think, of ECH um, are to, I guess, first and foremost, not you know, negatively affect any existing security properties, TLS 1.3. It was about saying like it shouldn't worsen any 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 uh, security aspect um, of the protocol. Um, uh, it should be, from a privacy perspective, uh, the, the goal is to make it so that every uh, ECH uh, server or name in the same anonymity set or connection to any of these particular servers in the same anonymity set is um, and distinguish them from one another, modular traffic analysis, because padding might change, padding might be done on the server side, it might not be. Um, this is more like uh, from clear text signals, whether or not you can uh, distinguish elements from the set. Um, support uh, from ECA, or support of ECH, like whether or not a particular server actually like will decrypt something um, if you send it a valid ECH config, um, remains secret unless you know the ECH configuration. Um, uh, for passive attackers, uh, because you can imagine like programming a middle box with a known ECH configuration, and then it's just like looking at the the record or the config digest as it flies by, and seeing whether or not it's meant uh, to be an actual ECH um, uh, connection. Uh, but active attackers are we're not trying to hide the support from active attackers who, uh, as Ecker pointed out earlier, can like easily figure out this information from DNS. Um, uh, Moreover, uh, negotiation of ECH or actual usage of it for a particular connection um, uh, is secret from a passive attacker. Like you can't figure out whether or not ECH was actually used, which is what uh, the PR that Chris put together um, allows us to do, um, similar to how the you know existing trial decryption functionality works. Um, uh, but again, it's not meant to uh, be secret against uh, active attackers and there's various, um, you know, subcases broken down, but um, I think this captures the gist. Uh, I, I'd like to hear if folks agree or disagree with this. Um, so I'd like to codify these and like get them in the draft, um, assuming we have consensus on them, just so we can, you know, stop circling on things that might or might not be in scope. Yeah, Ecker. Yeah, I think this is really good. Um, the one thing I would change is that in the second bullet point under um, under uh, under uh, under goals, um, you should know that this is including active attackers. Yes, yes, very good point. Um, I mean, I think a good way to put this is like the 
the the usage of ECH, I mean, I think you have this here perfectly, but the usage of ECH is secret from passive attackers, but the the but the uh but the, the contents of the ECH are secret from everybody. <laughs> right, exactly. I'll update the issue accordingly. But yeah, this is, this is great. Um did uh I I'm sorry, but do we uh I'll, 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 I'll comment. I think I think you're there's no one else in the queue. Sorry, Ecker, were you gonna say something else or I have a comment on the on on, on, on Pier 287. There's no comment in oh, oh, all right. Okay. Does anyone else have any sort of uh, comments or, or feelings about this threat model? Does this more or less capture what folks think? So, so Chris, hey, this is Sean. The only thing I can think of is that we need to make sure that whatever was in the requirements document that we're not doing also gets captured. So like if there's if there's anything that's different between the two, I think we just have to make sure that we document that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, and there is like in the document, there's a section on uh, going through uh, you know the, the different requirements from that draft, and and commenting as to why we've deviated or not. But I, I don't know right now whether or not that's up to date. Uh, like one good example is like I think the the requirements document says that you know thou shall not stand out. Um, though clearly we're um, going to stand out a little bit. Yeah, um, the fact that the extension is there is a pretty good indicator. Right. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll keep a note of that, um, and I'll. I'll I'll review that particular section to see whether or not it's still relevant or needs to be updated. So I guess my only thought about this is whether we should be more explicit about what the things that we're not doing. Um, I I do agree that I think this is a this, this is this is gets the gist of it. Um, so um, one thing that uh, as Acker was sort of hinting at earlier, like this is not meant to be something like Tor. Yeah, like, absolutely. As, as, yeah. as an extension, it's not meant to circumvent. Uh, censorship. Um, I often hear that you know this is a you know a, a mechanism or a, a technology for allowing that. Although I think that um, is a bit misleading and, and wrong, given that the current design act doesn't actually allow that. So I, I'm hopeful that the text here um, with this particular threat model makes it clear that this is not a censorship circumvention technology. Um, but if not, like. Like maybe we need to add it, although I'm kind of hesitant about even using that word in this document. Um, I I understand why. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I think I think we should have the PR land and then you know like review the PR and see what it says and then see what other people say. So yeah, yeah. thanks. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, I just comment that I I think that the document that that lays out the don't stick out requirements is not. Is is a little less precise than we're trying to be here because we're you know we're kind of trying to grapple with the problem. Um, so I think I think yeah we should we should document what what what's different. But I really don't think that there's much that's different. Um, I also want to I also want to point out that you know we there it it might be possible to provide don't stick out security against active attackers for some deployment of ECH. I don't think for the vast majority of deployments, but I think that hanging on to that use case is still probably valuable. Um, it's just that it's not gonna be the main, at least in, you know, it's not gonna be the main way this thing is deployed. Um, so I think, I think we don't wanna rule out future use, uses of ECH, which do provide a stronger don't stick out property. Yeah, I'll we'll have to see if we can um, frame the text in that way. I think uh, we we sort of make it clear that the intended deployment for this is obviously via the DNS. Like we referenced the HTTP service record. Um, we use the term DNS, um, but you're right, and that it would be a shame if um, you know whatever we wrote down like did not reflect other deployment models. Um, so yeah. I, uh, as we put together the PR, we can just keep an eye towards that to make sure we're uh, future proofing it correctly. Um, Rich? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with the others. This is a really nice piece. I mean, even just 
if they exported his markdown, cut and paste it right into the, you know, this is the PR. Um, but I do think that we should say some words about censorship because the popular technical press will do it if we don't. And we don't want to have to spend all our time saying, no, this is not a censorship prevention tool, censorship evasion tool, right? I, I guess my, my I only did, allergy just... is to using that word. Um, I... I, I don't, but that I don't have a strong, you know, uh, reason as to not use it other than um, it could potentially pollute the draft. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, see, I, I don't think, I mean, we'll be writing it or the, the working group is writing it. And so I don't think we're going to get polluted. But I think if we don't say it, then other people will put words into our mouth and we'll have to go, no, 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 that's not really what it is about. Right. I mean, imagine you yeah. know what. Imagine what you're going to see in TechCrunch when this gets published, <laughs> or right. or the Register, right? Yeah. And okay. then China goes, "Oh, look at this!" And they turn it off with the Great Firewall. Yeah. That's... Does anyone else have a a feeling about that particular uh, inclusion? I'd like to see text. Okay. I think we should merge this, and then maybe we can work workshop that. Text. I guess I I believe in merge early, so like let's merge this, and then like we can and then we can do a separate PR for that if that one has the test that we good. Okay, cool. Um, I'll I'll create a PR soon, then we can land this, and then um, I'll send a message to the list following up on it. Uh, you know, particularly raising this issue, whether or not we want to, or how we want to work in the topic of censorship. Um, okay, cool. Uh, can we go back to the issues, please? Um, 253. Right, um, this is something we talked about last time. Um, uh, the, the idea was that uh, we have this ECH nonce currently. Um, it's kind of redundant with the um, client hello random that's also secret uh, by virtue of being encrypted in the inner client hello. Um, so the proposal uh, that, I, that we converged towards was removing um, the ACH nonce entirely and just relying on the randoms in the inner and outer client hello being different, um, uh, generated independently. Um, so Chris has a, a PR for this. Um, if you scroll down a little bit, Joe, I think link to it. Um, going two ninety two. Yeah. Um, so I, I just wanted to raise this um, uh, and and pause to see if. Folks have had a chance to review this. Um, the, the text is uh, fairly self-explanatory. It does what the issue should does. It removes the nonce from um, the inner client hello extension, and it more carefully describes how uh, to specifically construct the inner and outer client hello. Um, I think one thing that came up during this uh, particular PR um, that is sort of um, I guess it's not directly relevant to the, the nonce itself, uh, which we've agreed to remove. Um, more so, uh, it's on the, um, the inclusion of padding inside the inner client hello. Um, uh, can you scroll on just a little bit more? Um, well, okay, I, I forget where it is. Oh, there it is. Um, the last uh, line 452. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I, uh, I reviewed this PR earlier. Um, there is this must include padding clause, um, uh, specifically using this particular uh, technique described in this padding section. Um, I was recommending to drop it from a must to a should. Um, under the assumption that some people might not want to pad that particular way, or they might not want to pad at all, depending on what their deployment scenario is, whatever. Um, I'm, I think it'd be useful just to like 
quickly flush this out. Well, I think this is not the place for it in any, in any case. Um, like, the, I, I, the, I, the, 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 I mean, the, 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 the padding, there's like a padding section. And if you want to type, people use padding, you should go to the padding section. Um, uh, so I think like, I, I think sure is the right thing here, or even may. I mean, um, I mean, the, the key the key point here is this is how we think you probably ought to pad if you're going to pad. Um, but if we're going to tell you to pad, if we're going to tell you you have to pad, it should go to the padding section. Yeah, basically, um, I'd be fine with that. So I think a should is the right may thing. Or here. should whatever. Yeah. Um, the other okay. Uh, let's just anyone else. Um, the other uh, point in this PR, Kristen, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to like nitpick your PR uh, in, in real time, um, but these are just like things that we've talked about in various places or different threads um, that I think would be useful to just air right now. Um, what One of the, the instructions for generating the hour client hello is um, uh, to be careful, it's, it's if you scroll up, Joe, um, is to be careful on how you actually, uh, or what extensions you actually include. Um, uh, it has been, asked whether or not um, it makes sense to include a PSK binder in the outer client hello. Um, so uh, I guess that I, I, I am of the opinion that there doesn't really make much sense to include a PSK binder in the outer client hello, because um, the only time uh, you'd actually be making use of the outer client hello is if you are going to uh, retry and establish a fresh connection with new ECH keys. Um, and it just, seems like it's easier from the client's perspective if you only ever attach a binder to one client hello. Um, though, uh, I, yeah, okay, I'm from the chat. I think that makes sense. Um, uh, the oddity is like, I, I guess if you had a ticket to, you know, hoster.com or whatever, um, this is a this is a mess. Like, let's just let's just say you can't you can't resume. When I'm you're fine like... with that, but like, I, I I'm basically curious to know if anyone like feels very strongly like that we should be able to resume a connection that you're never going to use. Um. <laughs> now, now we have to, like reason about it. Let's just ban it. <laughs> I think you answered your own question there, Chris. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay, very good. Um, uh, cool. Um, Uh, Jonathan, the, the, the issue there um, was with the earlier ESNI design. Um, you would, uh, the, there was no distinction between which client hello you were actually consuming because uh, there was only one client hello with the encrypted SNI. And the, the, the server reaction attack or the ticket oral oracle attack was when, like, the ticket might encapsulate, you know, uh, like the actual SNI that was used to fetch the ticket. And if the server checked to see that, you know, this particular ticket SNI does not match the SNI um, inside the encrypted ECH value, then it might um, behave differently. Um, so you're effectively giving you know, an active adversary an Oracle. Um, but in this design, like the server will only consume either the inner client hello or the outer client hello. And since the attacker can't augment the inner client hello uh, due to encryption, we're, we're not concerned about that. Or I claim we're not concerned about that. Or should not be concerned about that. Um, okay. Um, great. Uh, I guess the only other one that I would like to get to is 264. Um, this again is something that we talked about uh, last time, but now we have David here. Um, so I, I think we can, uh, David and Alessandro, thankfully, um, so we can hopefully uh, get through this pretty quickly. Um, so uh, David raised this issue about how padding is weird with quick, um, and that we might not want to rely on the record layer. Um, it was pointed out that, uh, you might be able to use, uh, certificate extensions, uh, to add, uh, padding on the server side, but that doesn't work well currently with, uh, the certificate compression draft, which takes like the whole certificate message and just shoves it into a compressor. Um, so that like, as a result of the last interim, we, we quickly put a pause on that document to, to make sure we wanted to work through this or to make sure we work through this issue before, um, you know, designing ourselves into a corner. Um, and I guess we didn't really come to, um, a, a, a conclusion as to, you know, what should be the right mechanism for padding. Um, 
uh, so I, I, I thought it'd be good just now that everyone's here on the call, um, we could chat about it. David, do you want to say a few words about this? Uh, am, I, am, I, am I unmuted? Maybe I am. You are unmuted. Cool. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you basically summarized it. The the padding thing in T, over TLS records padding for the quick has sort of stuck a little like abstraction boundary between the handshake and the record layer, uh, which means that like interactions between the handshake and the record layer are suddenly much more complicated than they used to be. Mm -hmm. um, and oops, uh, yeah, there's a so if we ended up moving the padding into the handshake, which seems to be consistent with what Quick has done elsewhere, then uh, that would keep that interface nice and simple. But now we have to design yet another padding mechanism, which is all kinds of fun. Yeah. So I think I I, I agree with David as as the fundamentals. Um, uh, I think I think I guess my put is I think we have a straightforward solution for this for SNI, which is to um, either invent or use the old padding extension. And um, and then just permit and then just un un unwind the restriction that it can't be an EE, and then as long as you're able to project how long the certificate will be, you can pad as much as you want in the EE. And remember that the remember that the boundary the message boundaries should be should be concealed in any case. Um, that that doesn't solve the problem of the client to server um, uh, padding. But as I said, if we, that's a problem. That's actually a problem respective to SNI. So I think we should solve that it separately. Um, if people think that the if people think the EE thing is hacky, then I think the fix is to um, is to permit padding in the uh, in the certificate message, um, uh, and 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 but that of course requires changing certificate impression, which I don't think is worth it, which probably is the wrong answer. Yeah, certificate impression is very far along at this point, and we'd have to like burn a code point and do all sorts of things if we were going to change that. Um, Alessandro, um, speaking as an implementer on the server side. Um, how allergic are you to, uh, you know, using padding extension in EE um, and uh, uh, to, to cover or hide the, the size of the server's flight? The idea being that you'd have to, like, sort of, you know, based on what certificate you're going to select, choose the appropriate padding in EE to match. Um, I mean, surely you know what certificate you're going to, you selected at this point already, right? Yeah, I guess that. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I, 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 I guess I could see it varying based on implementation. Like, you, you might want to just send the EE right away, and then like, like go off and you know send your RPC to get the right certificate. I don't know. Like, that sounds horrifying. I, I, <laughs> so, if certificate compression is used, then the padding might. Um, depend like the size of the padding might depend on the result of the compression of the certificate Wouldn't right it? but presumably you would know if certificate compression is in use right yeah no what i'm saying is you don't know how big the certificate is going to be um before you actually compress it right so you need the certificate in hand basically i mean see, you need, you need the compressed certificate in hand I mean, so what, what I'm saying is, you you send you set whatever EE, and then um, later the certificate is sent, and um, the compression might happen like just in time. So when you're setting the EE, you don't know how big the certificate message is going to be, and the size of the you know the compressed certificate. Um, might change depending on I don't know the the common names the the uh, alternative names or whatever. I don't know if that's actually a problem. Um, it could just simply be you you add whatever uh, uh, like a fixed amount of padding, and then that would cover whatever compression you use. So I don't know if I'm explaining myself like clearly, but. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I guess I mean, I guess, I, it's just a practical matter. Either you have to put the padding, you know, here, or you have to put it in some some location that is after um, that, that is you know after the certificate's been compressed, right? And so that either means, and so that, and and so like either that means, so, so so as far as I can tell, the alternative, given that David's right, and we don't want to like have it in the record layer, the alternatives are um, stuff it in uh, stuff it in EE. 
uh, stuff from the certificate message and revise certificate compression, or invent some new message that appears after <laughs> after uh, uh, certificate message. And I can tell you, I'm like really I'm really opposed to the third one. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I guess I, I'm not really sure I understand um, how an implementation would choose the size of the padding. Um, I'm I'm fine with the with the EE solution. Um, putting it in the uh, in the actual certificate message might be problematic if you pre-compress the certificate message rather than doing it just in time, um, because then you wouldn't be able to actually add additional extensions later. Uh, so the, the EE solution is probably the more flexible. Um, I guess from an implementation perspective, it, it just kind of, it, the, the complexity comes down to how you choose the actual size of the padding. I agree, it's yucky. So I, I'm fine with this complexity, is what I'm saying. OK. Uh, David, can you speak on behalf of the server for boring? Um, yeah, so I guess to answer Alejandro's point real quick, I, I'm, I've been sort of assuming that the way you choose the padding is that you have some target size or something, and then you'd like subtract like the padding would be like size of the certificate message minus target size or something along those lines, some function of of the of the size of the final certificate. So you would need to assemble the certificate message and like or at least measure all the lengths um, and then go back and like fill in all the other stuff, um, which is certainly doable. Um, like I'm looking at our implementation and, and we certainly have the certificate available by then and we actually assemble it all in like one function all at once. Um, say we have been pondering some stuff some some like designs where we do something where like uh because like if, if you end up having to do like an rpc to look up the server certificate um uh and then you separately need to do an rpc to do like a signature that's kind of annoying it'd be nice if you could like do one rpc and get them both at once um and so you could imagine doing something where like oh because the certificate and the certificate verifier are so close together you could like hand the thing over like the transcript so far and ask it to produce just the certificate message and that like cuts down on the amount of like places where you've got to like cut a line in between tls and so this would kind of mess that that sort of thing up where you now have to uh like the 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 thing that's looking at the certificate and doing the signature needs to be able to like compute the padding for you and like inject the padding back into the encrypted extensions because once the signature has been made, like you can't go back and change it. So that's a little annoying. Um, I think it's probably workable. Um, so I'm not like hugely opposed to it. It does sort of like make me raise my eyebrows slightly, but oh well. On the client certificate side, uh, somewhat tangentially, we've been looking at, uh, I think Ecker suggested for the Alps draft that we switch the message that we added to an encrypted extensions. And so if that all ends up going through, which is not even adopted yet, so like who knows, uh, like that could be one solution for generalizing the client, this, this mechanism for client certificates. Yeah, um, I think Ecker's uh, right in that treating these as kind of two separate cases, like the, the client side uh, size leak it being orthogonal from uh, server side size leak. Um, treating those two separate things and potentially trying to address the second or the first one later via ELPS or EE or new handshake message, whatever um, makes sense and moves us forward. We'll note right now also that this is like uh, totally optional on the server side. You don't have to pad. Um, you, you, you should. You, but you, you should, but like, I mean, you could also just, it doesn't have to be like for super precise either, or it might not have to be. You could imagine just like padding to some obnoxiously large size and then just like running with that. Um, yeah, I, I want to fly one more point in case it hasn't, um, people haven't noticed that you also may, if you have multiple uh, sizes of um, of server keys, you also have to pad that out. So say you have RSA and you have ECDSA, um, then you have to, uh, you have to of course pad out. Or, or not, but you're leaking information if you don't. So it's not just, it's not just certificate, it's also, it's also certificate verified. It can be different size. Yeah, I'm assuming this is not like specifically about the certificate, more like just yeah, yeah, yeah. add effectively the entire server. Exactly, yeah. I, I just yeah. want to find it, yeah. yeah. Oh, certificate verify would be fun if you want to hide RSA versus ECDSA. I mean, it's going to be... He's really big. <laughs> well, the, I mean, that too, but also the ECDSA signature is variable length. Ha <laughs> ha.
Oh, that's the worst. I don't know if you actually want to hide RSA versus ECDSA, but that's another matter. Um, but if you did, I think the encrypted extensions design would explode. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's Incidentally, actually... when are we going to finally have Ed25519 in the PKI? <laughs> don't hold your breath. Um, okay, so I think what I'm hearing is that um, the EE approach right now is is not too onerous. Um, uh, we, it might require us to revisit some things uh, depending on you know future server side design deployments going on, or that might happen later down the road. Um, and this padding of the certificate verify issue might be a little bit tricky, but um, on balance, perhaps it's the right approach. It, and it allows us to treat separately the client uh, side uh, in either this draft or even in um, a follow-up draft like Alps or something. Uh, David? Also, just for completeness, I'm curious, Akar, what the objections to the new message are. Um, like, I, I'm okay with this design as well, but like, it, it seemed to me the new message was sort of like fairly straightforward to process and was analogous to like, if I imagine sticking in the quick layer, probably what I would do is like change the crypto frames so that like rather than being a stream of bytes, it's like a stream of like bytes from two streams. Um, that didn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, and that is approximately what happens when you stick like a padding message inside the, the handshake. Yeah, I'm not sure I have a, a, anything other that feels gross. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Um... I made a note on the issue to reflect this, uh, and uh, we can work on a PR um, to enact it and then land it. Um, all right, uh, so there's only two other things I'd like to go through. Can you go to the pull requests, Joe? Two sixty nine. Um, this has been up for a while, uh, and I don't know if Ben is here. He's not here. Um, you want me to go to the... Uh... Yeah, the okay. change is fine. Um, uh, yeah, have, have folks looked at this? Um, and, and if so, do we want to allow it? I don't like object to it. Um, who wants to do it? I, I not sure. Um, um, yeah, and I, I don't object, but why? It's just additional greasing. Yeah, I, I don't know. Unfortunately, I, I guess um, it would be better if Ben was here. Um, maybe guess... has a particular use case in mind. Like, if we were to do this, then it ends up, like, like a client that wants to do this ends up having to pay for, like, three extra rounds. Is it three? It's super yeah, expensive. Three extra round trips for every connection, which, like, if we want to build a way to do ECH without, like, it seems the use case for this is uh, for a server to deploy ECH without having to as tightly synchronize their server, con their server configuration with DNS. Uh, which seems like potentially a useful thing for deployments. Um, but if we were to do that, like I don't think we would want to do it with a three round trip penalty when we could actually when like we could do it with a one round trip penalty in principle if you know you like like effectively all of ECH is an optimization around like you 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 do the client hello and server hello and then once you've got the handshake keys you like actually send the SNI and various other client hello bits. Um, which is a one round trip penalty. We don't really want a one round trip penalty, so hence the DNS stuff. Um, but if you are conceding the DNS stuff anyway, you probably don't want a three round trip penalty. That seems pretty significant, and it seems we shouldn't be encouraging that. Yeah, yeah, I agree, dude. I mean, I think like let's let's get it. Let's get a firm reason why this is a good idea, and if it's like if, it, if it's convincing, then we can do it. But if not, like it's just more, it's just more crap. I mean, could be also like following um, the other. Issues and possible ideas like just throw this in the extension in the ECH config, like allow clients to do this if the server deems an, it worthwhile, and then an, ex an excellent point. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll make a note in the issue that um, 
not all, there's not a lot of enthusiasm for this particular change. The use case is not clear, and this is also something that could be addressed with an extension. So good to punt. Great. Um, only one other issue then. Um, if you go back to the issue list, Joe. And while you're pulling it up, um, it's way down at the bottom. Uh, 251. <clears throat> um, so Fred raised uh, a question of whether or not we should have basically a mandatory to implement CAMS um, so that clients know which one to choose. Uh, I know in discussion with people who are working on ECH uh, that the choice of CAM is uh, uh, fairly obvious and like people are probably going to use the same thing, but um, uh, you know, certain people uh, don't really care for mandatory to implement cipher suites. Um, so I, I, I'm just curious to hear what folks think about this particular proposal. I think TLS has decided it likes mandatory to implement cipher suites. It does or does not? It does. I mean, it's like we have them in 8446. So I think we do, but I mean, should we also have them here? I, I think I think that's a reasonable theory, yeah. I mean, I'm not gonna die on the sale either, but I think that like I think that TLS has decided it likes them. So um like let's not relitigate that now. I guess um, okay. Uh, so have, uh, go ahead. Sorry, Chris. I was just thinking, like, from a getting through the process uh, perspective, um, I understand why people might not want to pick one, but I can understand the ISG saying, you know, why didn't you pick one? Well, you know, you picked them elsewhere. Why couldn't you pick it here? It's an answer, something we'd have to answer. So if we don't, we have to come up with a reason why. It seems like it might be easier just to pick one because typically that's what you do. So. Um... Uh, so I guess that raises the question, which chem in particular? Uh, I know that the, of the chems that people are implementing, most of them are based on X2509. However, I think the mandatory suites or key exchange groups inside A446 are like P256 um, and, and not 2509. Is that right, Ecker? Yeah, it's, a, so, it's like a should. So uh, does that mean we should also have P256 as a mandatory to implement one? If so, that would uh, change people's plans right now, as I understand it. Um, what did MLS do? That's a great question. Um, I don't know. I'm just trying to figure out, like, I mean, when we did P256, it was, like, on the edge of, like, 25509 being, like, you know, the thing. Yeah. Um, and so it may just be things have changed. Um, but that's why I'm curious how, like, MLS, MLS addressed it. They just decided it was 25509. They did. Oh, they did? Yes. Ah, yes, Cypher Suites. I mean, I don't think having these being consistent is like a disaster. They're like not, they're not connected. I mean, they, back at, like when we first did this, they were like really connected, but now they're completely disconnected. So, I mean, yes, it would mean you need a 25509 stack and it p 226 stack, but like, so what? Okay, I mean, so I mean, I guess let me, let me I guess let me make let, let me make a second observation, which we now we now as of today we've adopted eighty four forty six bis, and so if we wish to change the mandatory cipher suites, we can also do that. That's true. Good point. Um. Uh, okay, so uh, I guess unless there's objections to this, we can propose a PR, um, and I would pick a cam based on X two five one nine. Fred is here actually, so Fred, is that a cam that you? Would like to choose yeah i think it makes sense it, it would also make sense to prevent having um based on other like tlf mandatory cipher suites um uh, an algorithm that wouldn't be present elsewhere but uh to me either are fine it, it's pretty hard to stop people from registering things though especially because the way we set it the bar so I think that because we set the thing at specification required, anybody who wants to do this can start specifying their own, unfortunately. Yeah. Whether they I'll get implemented, that's a different story, but, you know. Yeah. I'll note that HPKE doesn't specify any mandatory to implement things. So um, I don't know if that's relevant or not. It's just, it's like this random collection of, you know, arbitrarily composable chems and KDFs effectively. Um, 
Well, so actually, I, I think I think it's more important that this have an MTI than TLS did because TLS you would just get like, um, you know, like as a practical matter. Um, well, okay, maybe I don't track that, but um, I mean, like putting people, teaching people which one to use here is like valuable because it's like you don't you don't get a lot of feedback, right? Like you just find out that nobody like like if you broadcast if you decide to do you know. If you decide to do uh, sec, sec, sec p two fifty six k one, um, and and no one decides to connect to you, you don't know like there's nobody do there's nobody do ECH or do they just not like sec p two fifty six k one, right? Yeah. So having everybody use the same thing is pretty is pretty it's pretty attractive here, because it's expensive. Yeah. To add, it's it's more expensive to add new ones to the DNS than it's just like add a new one to your TLS and Yeah, I mean I think we should probably leave a little bit of rope for say a application profile to specify a different default, but I think having a MTI in the absence of other direction seems to make sense here. Cool. I guess in my, in my thesis is we should actually probably encourage people to like, like we should say you should deploy it to five. I assume it's two five five one nine. We should say you should do a two five five nine one. Like you, you must support it. And you should, and if you're a server, you should publish one. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Chris. I was wondering if it makes sense to have a mandatory to implement chem. Should we also have a mandated um, KDF and AEAD? I'm just raising the question. I don't really have an opinion here. I'm just wondering if it makes sense. Yeah, we should express it for the whole thing. Okay, so we'd, ha we'd have to pick a chem, an AEAD, and a KDF. Yeah, yeah though I assume that's, I assume that's Shasha 56 and, a and AES. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy with that. Uh, Rich? Yeah, I was just going to say, right, so this shows up in the EC config thing, and if we put less data in there, I mean, it's two different organizations or sub-organizations probably that have to collaborate on this stuff. So, uh, yeah, I'm totally in favor of 255.19, AES, 256, SHA-256. Great. I will draft a PR to make it so. Thank you, Fred, for the suggestion. Um, that's it for the issues that I wanted to cover. Um, we have seven minutes left. Um, is there anything else folks would like to talk about before we conclude? I'll note that with landing these changes, um, we're probably in a good enough state to, uh, ship draft eight, um, which would be the target for implementation, uh, for folks and, uh, all the remaining issues that have not yet been resolved are mostly editorial in nature. Um, so. Uh, we can address them separately with lower priority. Real quickly, I just wanted to mention that I made a lot of noise about changing the outer extensions mechanism. Um, I started working on working on it, and it doesn't seem that bad. It doesn't seem it seems fine as it is. So I'm happy with uh, closing out that issue without a change. Um, well, I mean, let's, let's, I guess, address that later after, you know, you get through the change and we have some sort of more, um, uh, experience to draw on. Um, but I certainly think that's like not essential for, you know, shipping this to start. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying we don't need to make the change for draft date. Yes, exactly. Okay. Good. Um, I, that's all that, like I said, that's all I have. Um, Joe, Sean, anything else? Nothing for me. Nothing for me, other than to thank Rich for taking notes. Yeah, seriously, thanks, Rich. Cool. I guess we call it five minutes early. All right. Everybody, have a good day. Thanks, all. Bye-bye.